Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang sarananga chami dhammang sarananga chami sangang sarananga chami Dutiyampi Bhutang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Dutiyampi Sangang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Bhutang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Tatiyampi Sangang Sarananga Chami So nice to see everybody again today, Tuesday. The fourth of September, first day of school. <laughs> I didn't go. <laughs> and so uh, yesterday I had the uh, chance, there was this, uh, I came here uh, early in the morning, Bhante had invited me uh, out for a dana, which was in Pickering, uh, very close to where I live, and uh, just on the other side of the shore, and then after that, uh, came back here and he said, okay, you know, there's an event tonight. Uh, you you want to stay for it? And I said, sure. And so it was this uh, kind of event that uh, they'd organized here at the temple. They started a cultural committee and they had this uh, first back to school event uh, for the kids. And I think uh, your son was there. And uh, there was maybe like 40 kids or something or <laughs> 50 kids. A lot of kids came and their parents came and they had a kind of bake sale to uh, raise this money for these kids going back to school. And so, you know, I remember myself kind of first day uh, back to school as a kind of young man, you know, each grade is like such a huge uh, step. <laughs> you know, kind of <laughs> when you're like in kindergarten going into grade one, it's like this enormous milestone. And you know, when you think about it, it is, right? You're going from kindergarten where, okay, let me teach you guys what red and blue and uh, yellow <laughs> is. And you can guess what, and then you're playing with your glue. <laughs> and then you go into uh, grade one and suddenly you learn how to read. It's kind of this whole uh, world of uh, opportunity uh, opens up for you. And so remember actually uh, being a little kind of a guy and learning how to read and trying to learn how to spell and then suddenly these kind of uh, names that, you know, I never knew what they meant before. They started coming into focus, you know, kind of coffee time, you know, coffee time. <laughs> or kind of McDonald's, you kind of, McDonald's. <laughs> it's kind of a whole world uh, opens up that I uh, never knew about before. I had never seen before, kind of never imagined before. You know? And it's the same thing, kind of a similar thing going into uh, grade two, it's another huge, uh, another change, maybe not as big as grade one. Grade three is another change, another big change. Grade four, and grade five, you start doing more complicated math. Grade six, I can't really remember, there's you know, more stuff, right? Grade seven was a big one, I remember in my day, you, you started taking science then. So that was fun, you got to do burners. And then grade eight, you're about to go into high school. And then the next big transition is high school. And then high school each year is very different. You know, you got grade nine and 10 and 11 and each one of these years you're getting bigger and bigger, you get a car <laughs> and you got grade 12 and you're about to graduate high school. And then you've got university. And uh, university is another enormous change. Kind of it's this whole different environment, completely different than high school, completely different than elementary school. And then your first year is something crazy and overwhelming and then you get used to it and uh, fourth year is another big change. And if you go on to graduate studies, that's another big change. <laughs> and then you go into the workforce, it's another big change, right? And then if people get married, it's another big change. And they get a career, that's a big change. Then they have kids, that's another big change. And their kids get old and leave and go to university, that's another big change. <laughs> and they retire, that's another big change. And the last big change is when they die. <laughs> 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 
And so all through, uh, all through our lives, you know, these kind of things graph uh, in an interesting way. Kind of there's a pattern to the way we adapt to things, to the way we get used to things, and to the way we build up a kind of sense of self around things. And kind of these things, they seem so solid, like they're never going to change. I remember when I was in elementary school, kind of uh, your social life is really important. You can be important when you're a kid, you know, and you're in elementary school and there's these uh, kids, you know, they go to all the parties and, uh, you know, they're good in school and everything's great and, uh, you know, it's, you know, it seems like that world will just never come to an end. You just can't imagine how it could, right? All these people, you know, all the people there, it's like, well, this is who these people are. And then you move into high school and sometimes the people who were not popular at all or didn't have a really active social life in elementary school, all of a sudden they're really popular in high school. It's like, whoa, how did that change? You know? And then sometimes the people in high school who were like the nerds or whatever, they go to university and they get really good jobs. <laughs> and all of a sudden the people who were like really popular in high school, they're like, oh, these guys are you know, making a lot of money here. You know? <laughs> Like, how did that change? Kind of seems like when you're there in high school, like this setup that you've got is just never going to change. You know? And each one of these kind of phases of life is kind of very easy to build a sense of identity around that particular phase, right? Kind of uh, in elementary school, I'm the person who does this. Maybe I'm the class clown, right? Maybe I'm the guy who's good at sports, or the girl who's good at sports, you know. I'm the guy or girl who's good at math, and this is who I am, right? It's not going to change. You know, this is something safe, right? Something I can take solace in. I've got this core. And then high school comes and it changes. <laughs> All of a sudden you might meet somebody who's a lot faster than you <laughs> at track and field. I remember when I was in elementary school, used to do uh, kind of long jump and uh, various track meets. And you know, all the people, after a while, you were going to these same track meets with the same kids for your whole elementary school life. And uh, eventually you got to know who you raced, right? And you kind of knew your pecking order. And then when you get to high school, all of a sudden you meet these kids and they're like incredibly fast. And you're <laughs> like, where do these guys come from? These guys are like Olympic athletes or something. <laughs> You know, when you go from like the, uh, your school level to the district level to the all Ontario level, and you go to high school, you're competing with all these high schools in the province, and they might even have a Canada wide one, but as far as I know in my day, they only organized for Ontario. And so this sense of self you might have had, like I'm this guy who can run really fast. You know, I, I can do it, you know. <laughs> that sense of self is forced to change. And when it's forced to change by these external conditions, then we suffer, can suffer a lot from that. Oh, I'm the guy who's good at math. And all of a sudden, you get an F <laughs> on your math test. Oh, I'm the guy who's uh, really well loved by everybody. And you move to a new phase in life, and all of a sudden, there's other people who are more well loved. Or you change your not so well loved in that particular situation. Or I'm the guy who's competent, the guy or girl who's competent. I can get these things done. And all of a sudden, you move from uh, your job, you know, 40, and you go into getting older and getting into 55 and 60. And all of a sudden, the skills that we developed that made us competent change. The ground under us changes. And younger people come up who are more competent. And all of a sudden, we feel incompetent. <laughs> What happened? <laughs> this kind of competent person has disappeared. Now there's this incompetent person. And so what the Buddha teaches us about this is, uh, is something that can seem a little bit uh, unusual at first. Right? Teaches that what there actually is, is that all these things, they come together as a result of causes and conditions. And when those causes and conditions change, these things change as well. In other words, our sense of myself, my sense of who I am, what it is that makes me, makes me, makes, uh, makes me a person, what it is I grab onto, all the conditions that allow me to grab onto that are bound to change. 
they can't stay the same. It's just not possible. You know? so the thing about this is that we need to create a sense of self-identity. Right? As not, <coughs> I remember there was, it's not really the case. You can just say to somebody, okay, you know, if you make a sense of self-identity around being good at math, around running around the track, around being able to get things done in your job, you're going to suffer. So don't make any sense of self-identity at all, right? Actually, if you're living in the world, have to make a certain sense of self-identity to a certain extent. This is what allows us to function. If we didn't have this sense of self-identity, I'm a person in this position who has these duties, I need to get them done and I have to fulfill them this way, it would be impossible for us to get anything done, right? Just couldn't function in the world. Just couldn't get our job done. Couldn't, you know, cross the street. <laughs> well, right? <laughs> but the Buddhist teachings about these things is actually is kind of an interesting path because his path is one that uses this sense of self, but not for finding a refuge in a sense of self. It's one that uses a sense of self to find the destruction of the perception of a sense of self. In other words, it's a path that kind of turns around and turns in on itself at each phase that we go up, which is why the Buddha gave this metaphor of his path it's like having a raft, you know, kind of a person on one far shore of this kind of uh, uh, dangerous wilderness, you know, and they've crossed through this kind of dangerous wilderness and then there's this kind of sea and on the other side of the sea is an island. You know? And that island is a place of safety. So then the person wants to escape this wilderness and so they spend time making this raft, you know, lashing it together and they put it in the ocean and, you know, they're paddling across, and then they finally get to the island. You know? And he says, what do you think, monks? When that person gets to the island, what do you think to himself? I'm paraphrasing here. I can never remember exactly. So what do you think to himself? You know, this raft has been really helpful to me. So let me pick it up and carry it around on my head and go wherever I like. <laughs> but he's like, what do you think? Would that person be doing what should be done with the raft? And they say, no, Lord. And he says, in the same way, you know, I say to let go even of dhammas, much less non-dhammas. Okay, when you get to the end of the path, you have to let go of even the dhamma. In other words, this is a path that turns in on itself. But it's a path that starts with building wholesome qualities. The same way we have a sense of ourself in elementary school, in high school, in adult life, in our retirement, so we're about to die. <laughs> Got this sense of ourself. This sense of self is a sense of our position in a set of given conditions. And so what the Buddha turns us in on is to, instead of having this sense, I'm a person who's like this, it's to take the conditions around us and to use them to build a sense of self beginning with wholesome qualities, beginning with the path of practice in the Dhamma. So we take the Buddhist teachings and we learn to build a preliminary sense of self around them. Instead of having a sense of self like, I'm a person who's got, you know, this job, this particular face, this kind of hair, <laughs> this kind of car, this kind of family, <laughs> you know, and that's who I am. We take instead, I'm a person who is virtuous. Yeah? I'm a person who is generous. And we learn to build a sense of self around these conditions. Yeah. I'm a person who can restrain themselves when the conditions around me are pulling me towards bad things. This is a sense of self that we build, a sense of our position in the world, a sense of our relationship to the world. We build a sense of ourself. I'm a person who's generous. I'm a person who's open-handed who's giving, doesn't latch on to things, who likes to help. Yeah? And this is a sense of self that we build. And these sense of selves that we build, just like the ones we build in elementary school, in high school, in our job, they're a sense of self that's built through doing, not just thinking, not just contemplating, but doing. 
So in the same way, I'm a funny guy in elementary school, that's based on that guy's ability to crack jokes in the class and make everybody laugh. In the same way, I'm a person who's good at math. That's based on that person's ability to do well on math tests, whether they do that or not. Same way, I'm a really fast guy. That's based on that person's practicing being fast <laughs> and running around. The nice thing about the sense of self that we build around virtuous qualities and the Dhamma is that it doesn't require us to compete with anybody. Actually, if we're around people who are more virtuous than us, this is a huge benefit. <laughs> that virtue that they have in order to be around them will influence us and help our virtue grow. If we're around people who are more generous than ourselves, that generosity will influence us. Being around those people, our activities will cause our generosity to grow. And when we build a sense of self around these things, this is a more secure sense of self than the ones we have around our job, around our family, around our abilities. Because as we see in each one of these phases in life, the conditions that seem so permanent suddenly change. The people who seem so powerful in the workplace, when they retire, it's a whole different ballgame. All of a sudden, you were like a surgeon and like an attorney general and like a, you know, a Supreme Court justice, and then this other guy was a janitor, and you retire and you're both like on the same level, going to the same lawn bowling games. <laughs> it can suffer a lot, have the sense of being a powerful person. But we cultivate this sense of virtue, this sense of generosity, this is something that's more stable because at all these phases of life we can practice it and it doesn't depend on our putting other people below us. Because when we push another person below us, it makes them unhappy. And if our sense of self is based on making other people unhappy, they'll do whatever they can to make us unhappy. Because <laughs> everybody wants to be happy, right? So we learn to build our sense of self around these things, around virtue, around giving, and we learn to build a sense of self around our meditation practice. Yeah. There's a more safe sense of self. We learn to become skilled in the practice of meditation. We learn to become a connoisseur of the practice of meditation. Somebody who loves the breath. Somebody who's crazy about trying to get better at practicing meditation. Like one of these people you see, like they have a hobby, they like to work on kind of old cars or whatever. Whenever that person has free time, they're like in the garage working on the old car, right? In the same way, we can learn to love the process of training our mind, the process of practicing meditation. We build a sense of self around these three things. This is a much more stable and wholesome sense of self. This is actually a sense of self that uh, builds up and actually is the one, the type of thing that gives us the mental energy, the mental strength to build all the other kinds of senses of selves that people love, these kind of wholesome qualities. But the Buddha actually, instead of having us, when we build these wholesome qualities that would allow us, say, to have more focus so we could do better at our job, or be more clear-minded so we could tell better jokes, or whatever it is, instead of using our focus for that purpose, he has us turn it in again to see how far can I take this virtue, you know? How far can I take it, you know? Where's the limit? How far can I take my generosity? Where can I go with these skillful qualities? How far can I go in meditation? In other words, we reinvest it to see how far we can go in all these things. You know? And the interesting thing about this reinvestment is this very process we learn a lot about the way that our mind functions in the world right now. And the way it functions is it goes through these cyclic changes, through the changes of elementary school, through the changes of high school, through the changes of university, through the changes of the workplace, through the changes of retirement. And then when we die, we take on a whole new larger set of changes, which has smaller ones within it again. And this is a process that keeps going on. And so when a person starts to notice this, when they start to see this process in various ways, the Buddha instructs us to develop disenchantment for that process itself. Whatever sense of self I build, wherever it is that I try to rest as a permanent basis, although it's good to build these senses of self, it's not like life is terrible or anything, 
But he instructs us to have very high ambitions. Hmm? To have an ambition to find the highest happiness. To have an ambition to find a happiness that doesn't change. And so when we start to notice this, wherever I place my sense of self, wherever this process takes place, wherever I'm born into a world of experience, I can see this is how long it lasts. When it lasts, it feels like this. When it falls away, it feels like this. And when it re-arises, I need to do this to build it up again. <laughs> you know? Kind of thing happens over and over again. In a minute, in an hour, in a day, in a week, in a month, in a lifetime. And when a person develops this kind of sense of watching this, of seeing the impermanence in these things, they start to want to find something better. And this is where the path of getting better in meditation lies. The path in getting better in virtue lies, one of them. The path in getting better in giving lies. The path of the Buddhist practice lies is in this desire to make it happen. This desire to get better at it. And this desire to find a way out. But the Buddha's teaching is also very uh, uplifting. Because he says, I don't instruct you to do these things if it wasn't possible to do. It's because it's possible to develop a sense of self around generosity or to develop generosity. It's because it's possible to develop virtue. It's because it's possible to develop all these things in meditation. It's because there is an unconditioned happiness that we get the instructions to practice this way. And when we start to put these things into practice on the basis of this desire, on the basis of seeing the way these things change, then we ourselves get knowledge that's independent of other people. We no longer need the Buddha. I mean, not, this is not to disrespect the Buddha. We no longer, but we don't need his teachings and books to tell us about this process. It's something that we see for ourselves. It's something that we know for ourselves. And so in this way, the Buddha's teaching starts outwards and comes inwards. It comes into us so that we know it. It starts with a sense of self and turns in on the sense of self to build a higher one. And at the end, from going inward to building better and better sense of selves, it turns on the whole process of creation itself, the whole process of building up identities, the whole process of existing in a world of experience to find something that's outside of that, to find something that's unconditioned. And so this is why the Buddha instructs us, make a good raft. <laughs> make a healthy sense of self. It's why he instructs us, generate desire to cross the stream. Generate desire to practice. And when we're crossing the stream, stay on the raft. Don't let go of the teachings. But when we get to the end of the path, even the teachings have to go for the sake of finding the island, for the sake of finding this place of safety. And this is when a person does what should be done with the Buddhist teachings. They use them as a raft to cross over, but for the sake of finding the highest goal, for the sake of finding this type of happiness. And they don't carry them around after that. <laughs> okay, so I think I'll leave that for your reflection.